welcome to a very slender Christmas. I'm Slender Man, and today I'm going to read to you from one of my favorite Yuletide stories. The screenplay for the 2004 Tim Allen comedy Christmas with the Cricks. Act 1, Scene 1, Interior. We interrupt a very slender Christmas to bring you a proper episode. Season's greetings, internet users. Well, Christmas is come and gone, and now we look forward to the new year. And how about that solstice? Were you awake at 5.30 a.m. to see the Mayan flying saucers and space whales? Wasn't that nuts? Well, in case you missed it, there will be a repeat performance in about, uh, 26,000 years or so. But back to the topic of Christmas. By now, you're probably sick of candy canes, pine needles, complimentary colors, and pieces of scotch tape that get stuck underneath your fingernails and won't come out no matter how much you pick at them. But most of all, you're probably sick of Christmas specials. Particularly, A Christmas Carol and Ten Nellis. But I've got one more Dickens adaptation to stuff down your stocking. This is Adventures from the Book of Virtues, A Christmas Carol. And guess what? It's a two-parter. Double the pleasure, double the dumb. Merry Christmas, I don't want to fight tonight. Merry Christmas, I don't want to fight tonight. Merry Christmas, I don't want to fight tonight. If you missed the last episode of Memory Lane, then you might not know what Adventures from the Book of Virtues is. Here's a quick recap. <coughs> that gets the point across completely. Oh, and wasn't I on some kind of unholy crusade? Nah, eh, fuck it. Got old after five minutes. A Christmas Carol is one of the most beloved classics of all time. You don't need me to tell you that it has been adapted numerous times for the stage, screen, small screen, radio, and probably a porno or two. So what the dickens do we got here? Porsche Light Entertainment, show me what you got. Scrooge is in the house. <laughs> Off to a good start. This fine adaptation begins with the drama club preparing for their annual performance of Victorian Secular Holiday Show. But Annie, a.k.a. Madam President, has other plans. We need more money so we can put on even more plays in the upcoming year. We're going to perform a newly written gymnastic dance musical called I'm Dreaming of a Galactic Christmas. Oh my god, that needs to exist. Mostly so us internet reviewer types have something else to make fun of. But the Glee Club here is not thrilled. Story about alien civilizations that come together on Christmas Day for universal tranquility. That sounds amazing. It's the Star Wars Holiday Special. I retract my last statement. Well, I think it stinks. Yes, Mr. Sherman, everything stinks. It does not stink. Listen to the background banter in this scene. Yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna, gonna wear tights either. Yeah. He's an actor in a drama club. How has he not worn tights at this point in his career? The club elected me as president, so what I say goes. Annie, you want things like sun and moon, idiot. Wait a minute. She's not gonna get away with this. Um... Is he gonna kill her? Oh, of course he doesn't. Instead, they take their problems to the marriage counselor. And today's crisis is... A Christmas Carol! Look, if Charles Dickens himself were alive today, he could have written I'm Dreaming of a Galactic Christmas. It's that good! Well, he did well in that episode of Doctor Who, so he might not be completely out of his element. Plato, however, is partial to Victorian literature, so he suggests sticking to the tradition. But Annie ain't got no time for this. Meanwhile, Subblot Theater presents Arian Suck, fighting over some... I don't know. But it's my turn! My turn this year! Why do couples always fight over the holidays? <laughs> Frank Welker, do your thing. Fantastic. But the rehearsal is a disaster, and advance ticket sales are minimal. I don't care if we have to rehearse straight through until opening night! And that little girl grew up to be Julie Taymor. Hmm, I don't think Annie is in the Christmas spirit. <laughs> Eh, you know, PMS and all that. See ya, kid. That night, Annie gets a visit from the Dickens himself. Why do you so dislike my chronicle? Why is Gossamer on his face? And why do they always use the old depiction of Charles Dickens? Why not the younger one, you know, 1842, when he wrote A Christmas Carol? Shit, I'd tap that. <gasps> oh, thank goodness. It was only a dream. Thank goodness, that was only awkward. Stay 
in there. Yeah, stay there, you inanimate object. Or magically reappear on the nightstand. Quality award winning animation there. Now we get into the meat of this episode. The literary interpretation. Merry Christmas. What right of you to be merry? You're poor enough. It seems that every cartoon franchise has adapted a Christmas carol. But why? Doing that play is like a tradition. My theory is that the characters are so universal. We all know an old curmudgeon that hates happiness or a well-meaning neophyte that's down on his luck. So in an attempt to keep this redemption story relevant, we continue to recast the drama using familiar characters that fit the archetypes. And I also know you're going to ask me for the whole day off. If it would be convenient. It's most inconvenient and it's unfair. But I suppose I'll have to give it to you. Oh, Miss Scrooge, thank you so very much. Wouldn't get a decent day's work out of you anyway. I think you should be more worried about his dysfunctional eyes. The next day in the real world. I'm having weird dreams about Charles Dickens. Yeah, I've been having erotic dreams about Raymond Carver. Don't worry, it's normal when you're an English major. End of part one. Begin part two. Just a little to the right. Ah, perfection. End of part two. Begin part three. And now we reach episode two, which finally introduces the ghosts. First up, the role of Jacob Marley will be performed by... Livestock. I wear the chain I forged in life. I think this implies that Scrooge's former business partner was a buffalo. The Victorian era was weird. You are nothing more than a figment of my imagination. Merely a piece of undigested potato. <laughs> That's my favorite part of Christmas Carol. Sees ghost. You're a potato. Now kindly leave. Oh, I just passed through all four of your stomachs. Next, we get the ghost of Christmas past, as played by Aristotle the... Oh, look at you, with your little cane, your little hat, you look like Mr. Peanut. I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? No, short past. I'm only two foot five. Ha <laughs> ha. In this rendition, Scrooge's past involves losing his, well, her best friend because of her off-putting greedy nature. Okay, they turn into romance into a friendship. That works in this version of the story. After all, Zack and Annie are the kind of people that constantly friendzone each other. Next, it's the ghost of Christmas present. Oh, look at you with your little scarf and pants. Puss in Slacks takes Scrooge to the orphanage where Zack Cratchit, or whatever his name is, delivers toys to the orphans. Come closer. Don't be nervous. I know that child. Oh uh, yeah, I recognize him from the paint can. He threw a snow! at me. Why is he limping? His feet are swollen from being outside barefoot. He doesn't own any shoes. Swollen feet? That's totally the same as being crippled and terminally ill. I see a child who will never be able to run and play again. That's why I don't go to cats for medical advice. Anymore. Next we got the most festive spirit of all. The ghost of Christmas coming up next. Oh, look at you! That is a hawk grim reaper. Holy fuck, that is awesome. Seriously, isn't that one of the most metal things you've ever seen today? No? Well, how about now? Like a bird, I think of all the spirits that have visited me. I fear you the most. And the hawk shows Scrooge that the orphan is now a proper Tiny Tim. And then brings her to... The graveyard. I think we're missing some scenes. Before I see what name is etched on that stone, answer one question for me. Actually, I can read it just fine. It says Annie Scrooge. That's you. My heart has changed. And this is where a lot of these adaptations fail. Scrooge isn't shocked that he's gonna die. I mean, he's an old guy. He knows that he doesn't got much time left. But what really gets to him, what really turns his character, is the realization that he will die hated and forgotten. In the book, Scrooge witnesses what little regard his death receives. It's likely to be a very cheap funeral. I don't mind going if a lunch is provided. Remember, this is the rich and powerful Ebenezer Scrooge. 
Dickens wrote this part of the ending to show that no matter how much wealth you attain, or how much power you command, it is your actions that matter upon your death. And Scrooge's actions caused a sick child to die. That's pretty rough. So it's not death alone that Scrooge fears, but damnation. And the worst kind of hell is the one we create on Earth, through our apathy, our greed, through our wants and ignorance, a burden we forever drag. But that aspect aside, the Book of Virtues rendition does keep the ending intact. Annie wakes up a changed man. Whoa, man. That book just doesn't go where you want it to go. First she settles the marital spat between the cat and the rodent. Don't spend your Christmas bickering like this. Give each other the best gift that you can. The Neil Diamond Buck set. Oh, you shouldn't have. Then she tells Zack that the awesome Galactic Christmas is cancelled in favor of that tired old play. And best of all, the profits from ticket sales will go to the local orphanage to buy the kids clothes, medicine, shoes, and I don't know, Team Fortress too. So the Christmas Carol formula holds up. A selfish character does an ethical 360 and discovers the true meaning of compassion. But why has this story lasted as long as it has? You gotta remember that Dickens wrote a Christmas Carol during the European Industrial Revolution when money was God and men were commodities. Ebenezer Scrooge was a bit of a common archetype amongst the society. Yes, I know. You'll tell me that many can't go there and many would rather die. Well, we'd better do that than decrease the surplus population. Good afternoon, gentlemen. It's easy to hate such mean-spirited curmudgeons, but it's far more satisfying to imagine such men having a change of heart, particularly around Christmas. And it's important to note that Dickens portrays Christmas as a very secular practice. The Puritans under Cromwell did away with the joyful celebrations and merriment. Apparently during those days he didn't say Merry Christmas. He just walked up to a dude and said, Christmas. Then he went back to making terrible English food. So by the 1840s, about 200 years after Crummel, the people of England wanted to return to those old traditions like the Christmas trees and the carol singing. And it wasn't about the church, but about creating cheerfulness and joy during the biting winter. Dickens grabbed onto this movement and set his story in an England where people had parties and feasted and visited each other and gave money to the poor. In my opinion, that is exactly what keeps Christmas alive. Obviously it's not the presents, and if you get stressed, then you're doing it wrong. And people try to politicize Christmas, make it politically correct by calling it a holiday, or egotistically denounce everything that isn't Christ related. But they're missing the point. Christmas is about people. In the midst of seasonal depression, commemorating what is good and pure and joyful as a reminder in the new year that it is worth celebrating life. But not life day. That's complete shit. Merry Christmas. Fade out. The end. God bless us, everyone. Yay, I got to say the line. Wait a minute. She's not going to get away with this.